Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, and we hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. Um, so this afternoon, we'll be talking about energy monitoring for cultural heritage institutions. So I'd like to first start by thanking the National Endowment for the Humanities, which provided the grant funding that made this webinar possible. If you have questions, please ask them as they come up. Um, you can do that by typing in the um, Q&A box that you see on your screen. We'll be addressing those at the end, um, but we appreciate your, your input at any stage and make sure that those get to the appropriate panelist. This webinar is being recorded and will remain available on the website that you see here. It's also where you um, would have gone to register. So both the recording and the PDF will be available for um, at least a year. If you are watching this webinar as a recording and you have questions, there are email addresses for all of the panelists provided on the last slide. So um, feel free to reach out with any questions you may have. I'd like to briefly um, go over our presenters today. Um, we'll be starting with the Image Permanence Institute, which um, I myself, I'm Kelly Krish, and my co-presenter will be Christopher Cameron. We'll be starting by talking about reasons why you would want to um, do energy monitoring, and then some of the strategies that you can use to reduce your energy usage. Following us will be Martin Schuping from the Golisano Institute of Sustainability, also here at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, Marty will be talking about different strategies to use for monitoring for energy usage. And that will be followed by Samantha Owens and Stephen Carrick from Glenstone Museum. And they will be presenting a case study based on um, the amazing work that Glenstone has done in terms of monitoring their energy and taking steps to reduce it. First, I'd like to start by introducing IPI. Um, we are a research laboratory based out of the Rochester Institute of Technology. We started in 1985, looking specifically at film and photographic preservation and noticing the impact of the environment in terms of their long-term preservation. This was broadened into other cultural objects and really focusing on preventive means to improve preservation and do so in more sustainable ways. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the video over to Chris to start um, the discussion on energy monitoring. All right. Th thank you, Kelly. Um, so why should we consider energy monitoring? Oh, there, if we're advancing, there we go. So why should we consider energy monitoring? It's just like data monitoring for monitoring data within a collection space. Uh, we're not gonna be able to change what we do not measure. So we're going to want to be able to actually collect that data so we can uh, effectively, uh, effectively and efficiently make some changes to our collection environment. By monitoring the data, we can establish baselines, we can set goals, we can identify opportunities that help for energy savings and to quantify the benefits of any operational changes that we're going to make. And there's a number of reasons or that we would want to do this energy monitoring. One, we're going to talk, we're going to look at environmental, uh, the effects of the pollutants, our carbon footprint on the on the planet itself. These can have detrimental effects to the environment, to human health, even to the collections themselves. So, we, we, you know, we want to look at from the environmental standpoint, we want to have less of an impact for our operation. We can look at from the financial point of view. Clearly, we're going to use, if we're using less energy, it's going to cost us less, we're going to have some financial benefit to that. We can also look at a legal perspective. A number of cities are instituting the energy programs, uh, like New York City's uh, Local Code 97, where they're trying to reduce uh, carbon emissions of buildings by 40% by 2030. You have those being implemented in large cities across the country, but even some smaller cities are starting to implement the same, the same uh, uh, laws or same codes. And there's also a social reason. We're looking at social reasons. We wanna, for some of the legal codes like the New York City code that, that's being enforced, um, they're gonna be putting a letter grade on a building similar to they do for food grades. So there's a, that social conscious where we want our, our, the public to feel good, to see and to know that we're actually doing our best, doing our part to help the environment to have less of a carbon footprint. So we want them to see that we, you know, we're doing the best we can. So what are some opportunities for us to reduce energy usage? This was a survey that was produced, I believe it's 2018 by, by the EPA over what were some of the biggest energy consumers in commercial buildings. And then again, these, these were um, commercial buildings or anything that was non-residential facility. 
And 70% of the energy was used by, uh, almost 70%, it was used by HVACR, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning, refrigeration, and lighting. So between heating, HVAC and your lighting is going to use the two of the biggest chunks of energy within these commercial buildings. So this helps us identify some, some opportunities where we can, we know we have our HVAC, we have our lighting. These are two of the points we can start looking at, start making our best uh, efforts, getting our best opportunities to reduce some energy consumption from, from here. So this is a lot of energy and consequently a big carbon footprint when you think about it. So we want to address the needs of we want to address the needs of you know being less uh, having less of a carbon footprint while at the same time taking into account the needs of the collection. We want to look for opportunities that do not negatively affect preservation um, the, while improving our sustainability. The two are not at odds with each other. They actually can go hand in hand. Um, remember, all of us will start from different baselines. We're not all starting on a, a level ground, depending on location, the, the type of climate you're in, the building type, or even your collections. It's all going to vary your abilities and the uh, opportunities you're going to have to actually make uh, active changes within your uh, facility to that that can reduce your carbon footprint. Um, the difference between a historic house, a purpose-built building, um, even a new uh, construction can vary greatly. So it's something that we, you know, we keep in mind as we're looking at this, that somebody in different lo locales, like say Arizona or New York, may have different abilities or different opportunities to really affect their environment. So we wanna reduce our energy through passive means. And through this, we wanna think through each level, um, each of the uh, methods of control here. And as we're looking at the levels of control, we wanna think through the different methods of control for each of these. So for um, our policies and procedures, can we avoid or block um, any of the any of the, uh, the issues or energy loss um, uh, incidents, which I'll go over a few of these in a second. And the same with you know our location site, our building, our room, the storage unit. As we go through each of these levels, what are some of the ways we can look at that? And I will cover a few in a second. We'll start here with um, reducing our thermal load and moisture loads. This is an, actually an image of a exterior wall in a facility. Um, here you can actually see the studs, the red lines. There are actually studs of the wall, the metal studs being heated up from the sun. So we have solar load on the exterior of the building. That's going to heat the, the face of the building up. Just like the heat sink of a computer, it's going to carry through on the metal studs to the, uh, the face of the wall. And if you're looking at this image, the room is trying to hold about a 64 degree temperature and those studs are he being heated to about 75. So there is a 10, 11 degree difference between the room to those studs. So we have a, a, a warm spot that the mechanical system would have to compensate for. Similarly, we have the exact opposite happen in some wind in the winter time for some exterior walls where we have the cold wall, the exterior wall gets very cold. There's a heat loss there and the heat will transfer from the room through the studs and cause um, you'll see blue lines down the wall where it'd be colder spots. And again, now we have a cold microclimate where the mechanical system has to compensate there as well. And this is uh, this scenario is called thermal bridging. When, we, when something like this occurs, it would be something you want to uh, bring an architect or uh, really have them think about ways that you could uh, com combat this or, or change this. Um, but some other thermal loads we can get are from lighting. Remember, we're always going to pay twice for lighting, once to run the lights and once to remove the heat from the lights placed in the room. So we want to look at that from two perspectives. What are the ways we can reduce that, that lighting from either changing the bulbs or changing the duration, but also um, reducing that that heat that they place in that room and moisture loads can come from rising damp moisture coming through the floor leaky pipes things like that if we're addressing our room properly you know doing continuous walkthroughs keeping eyes on the collection space we can help reduce some of those risks to the room to the collection so we talk about reducing air leakage this is from a report that actually just came out in december and really, the, the first sentence speaks volumes. Air leakage is reportedly considered to be the greatest source of heat loss in buildings and a big contributing factor in buildings' energy use for heating and cool, heating or cooling. Recently, I had the opportunity to take an architecture class here on our university's campus. And within the, about the I think it was the first semester of uh, the course, well, the professor brought up the fact that if you were to take an average building, say uh, like a three-story uh, three building, you would take an average building and you were to add up all the penetrations through the walls, all the gaps under doors, all the un improperly sealed windows, 
that at the end of the day, you would have a three foot by three foot hole in the side of the building. So it's a very large space, if you will, for air to enter. So we wanna look at what are ways we can reduce that as much as possible. We wanna identify potential air leaks in the facility. Can we look for gaps under doors, under windows, properly seal them, uh, properly make sure you know, we, we're caulking anything we can. This is actually an image uh, we use a lot. And you can see this is, this is from a door that uh, was adjacent to a collection space. And here you can see we have gaps underneath the door on the bottom. If you're looking on the, the far right side of the door, there's a little bit of light on that shelf. That's actually from the side of the door where there was a gap, not from the window. Um, so we want to address any scenario like this to really reduce its impact on the collection space or even in, you know, for insects, but more, we also have that energy loss from if it's a windy day, a windy cold day, that's going to come right into the collection space. On days with significant difference, if you have, you know, typically it's, it's cool inside or it's, it's like 60, 70 degrees inside, but it's really cold outside, say 30 degrees, um, walking inside your collection space with an infrared camera, it can be used to identify locations with potential air leaks. Um, and those of you who are saying you don't have an infrared camera, we actually um, have an opportunity coming up within the next few weeks, hopefully the next month or two, um, we'll be opening up a tool loaning program uh, at IPI where we'll have some infrared cameras, some light meters, um, anemometers, tools like that, that will be available to public. We'll have some more information coming out um, in one of our upcoming newsletters on how to sign up. We'll even, I believe, put it to some of the distribution lists for, for everyone on how to uh, be able to sign up for tools. It'd be a two week loan to you know, have an infrared camera to really test and start looking at your collection spaces. So another thing is keeping up with preventative maintenance. I will, coming from my background as facilities and from the projects that Kelly and I have worked on together, um, I would be the biggest proponent of making sure preventative maintenance stays within a budget um, at all times. Uh, many times when we're on a project where we see faults or big problems happen is as preventive maintenance has been cut. Preventive maintenance is the uh, monthly, quarterly, or um, annually, however, um, inspection of the units to make sure everything's functioning properly. And a lot of times when budgets start getting cut, that's one of the first things that they'll, they'll dial back on. But where these problems occur, if you look at the, you know, the image on the left as an example, it's from a set of duct work that actually flooded. Um, water was almost uh, halfway up that duct and you could walk down here, it's uh, about six feet tall. So it's something someone, if they were keeping eyes in there would have been able to catch, they would have seen, you know, prevent. And similarly, the image on the right, this is something we see uh, pretty often. Uh, it's a, the face of a cooling coil. And if you look, there's a lot of, we'll, we'll call it crud on the face of that coil. And that buildup, it really reduces the effectiveness of the coil. An EPA report that came out of, uh, about a year ago um, did a survey of mechanical systems, especially the cooling coils, and identified that a really co a congested cooling coil can reduce its efficiency by about 20%. So wherever the cooling coil may have started for its, for its you know, capabilities has been reduced over time due to that congestion on the face of the coil. So those of you who are in historic house, you, know, you have, may have questions, what things that I can do? Well, one of the things we have is using micro microclimates to your advantage, where you might not be able to truly or solidly control um, the environment. If you're looking at this graph, the orange in this graph represents the outside air, and the maroon is actually from the collection space. It was a, a not a well sealed collection space, and was very much the space was along for the ride with whatever was happening outside. However, you could see that we use those blue kit, this blue cabinet, a cabinet specifically made for to control relative humidity, to keep that relative humidity in balance. You can see that blue line there, how well that held it within that structure, even with the fluctuating relative humidity outside going up to you know, over 80, 85% at one point in time. We wanna also look at reducing our mechanical, mechanical energy use. There's a number of ways to do that. And one of the ways here is an uh, example of uh, trying to find inefficiencies. And there's an, ex an, an example of an inefficiency of heating and cooling at the same time. Um, the image on the right, on the left, was something we found with an infrared camera after we collected data. Um, if you're looking at the data, the green line, there's two zones that serve this large collection room. Um, the zones dump out together. They're right literally side by side. So if you walk through the collection space, everything feels temperature wise comfortable. And that's what is identified by the two, the blue and red line in the middle. We see 72, 70 degrees. Um, but the data tells us one's superheating and one's really heating and one's cooling. And we have, you know, one vent putting out like 60, 65 degree air and the other one putting out 90 degree air to compensate. 
So, you know, we want to go through and identify some major energy inefficiencies like that to try and rectify them so that we can uh, use a lot less energy because this is a very energy inefficient operation. There's a, a, a little bit more of this information, if you will, in the guidebook. Uh, manu uh, it's a manual that IPI published a few years ago. It's a walkthrough, a step-by-step -step process on how to perform a mechanical system analysis. Uh, the way we like to describe it, or I like to more than anyone, is it's almost a uh, choose-your-own-adventure for energy system uh, analysis. So you can go through and really identify how your space uh, uh, looks, how your collection looks, and really define uh, of the several energy saving strategies we have in there, which one may work or how does it fit for your institution properly. And that is available at the uh, link. Kelly will actually send out the link to everyone so you, so you have it. And in there, there's a number of strategies. One of the, just an example of one of the strategies we have in there are the system shutdowns. Um, it's system shutdowns, basically exactly what it says. It require, it, re it recommends testing your different shutdown times within your facility to find out, can your system go six, eight or 12 hours shut off and how well will the space hold? Um, here we have a collection space that I believe is holding for eight hours or shutting down for eight hours overnight. So the blue and purple lines are just from the mechanical system to identify where that was shutting off. And uh, it shows we have the room there to really show there was no gain in the room. So if for this system shutting off for eight hours, we were able to save a third of the energy from that mechanical systems operation, which is a large amount of savings cumulatively over the year. And these are just some of the ways uh, that you, some of the ways we can use the results of energy monitoring to implement some actions. Um, again, that guide that we had, the guy that I spoke about a second ago, Kelly sent the link out, we'll send the link out for, and you'll be able to go on there and use that guide to uh, start looking at your own facility and making some more, some more changes. And uh, again, we'll also be providing some energy, some information in the future about the tool loan program so you can start uh, using some tools to make some changes within your own uh, institution. I'm actually going to uh, pass the, the baton off to Marty now. Uh, Marty Shooping, um, he is going to be talking about different strategies for energy monitoring and how to evaluate subsequent data. Uh, Marty, if you're talking, I believe you're, uh, we can't hear you. Yes, you were right. I was just trying to find the mute button. <laughs> my, my apologies. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Chris said, I'm uh, Marty Shooping, a senior project manager with the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute and Galasano Institute for Sustainability. Um, this, um, this portion of um, the, the um, presentation was uh, underwritten by uh, the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute. Uh, we're headquartered at RIT and, uh, and um, uh, established in 2008. We have about a, four, a little less than $4 million um, annual operating budget funded, um, uh, funded through the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, I won't go through all the focus areas, but we, we help um, we do a lot of projects in you know, uh, many areas of sustainability. Um, we're uh, affiliated with um, uh, five universities and the entire manufacturing uh, ex uh, extension partnership within New York State. Um, other, other universities are Binghamton, Cornell, uh, RPI, and Clarkson. Um, we assist uh, New York State companies, municipalities, and nonprofits. Our, you know, our uh, project costs range um, from generally thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars, sometimes more, sometimes less, and uh, and for the most part, uh, a, a, a large portion of the cost of those projects is covered um, uh, through uh, through the funding from uh, the DEC. So why would we wanna monitor energy use? I know Chris just went through this. I'm gonna look at it from a little different perspective. 
Um, we, we know from history that um, building energy uh, tends to increase over time for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, the, the building envelope can deteriorate, um, insulation can get wet, windows get old and leaky. The, the use of the building changes. Um, uh, people add, uh, add working areas to previous storage spaces so the lighting and the heating, uh, you know, gets modified. Well, so um, one thing we can do about that is do periodic um, audits or recommissioning up exercises to, uh, to reduce the, um, the waste. But you can see from this um, chart here that uh, between those audits, the building energy tends to go up again. If we continuously monitor <clears throat> the energy consumption, um, we'll be able to to keep an eye on, uh, on that and, and we'll be able to make changes regularly and basically uh, do a, a continuous improvement project um, to make sure that our, our energy use stays the same. Um, if we just track uh, the cost of energy and not the actual energy use, uh, we never know for sure if we're using more energy or, or if uh, the cost of the energy has just increased. So it's important to, uh, to be able to monitor the energy consumption itself. Um, I'm gonna talk about some different strategies for, um, uh, for um, monitoring the energy here. So um, these minimal are you know, relatively low time investment and, uh, and give you an opportunity to compare your facilities with, with other facilities. You can also learn some things about the mechanical equipment um, at this level. Um, when, I, when I say moderate, we're, we're, looking, we're gonna increase the resolution of the, um, the data that we're looking at uh, by looking at demand and, uh, and interval data. And I'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes here. And then finally, more detailed analysis, we'll look at sub-metering uh, equipment or areas of the building that, uh, that may be uh, all grouped together under one uh, utility meter. Um, and then, uh, uh, so the and building automation system is another uh, more detailed uh, focus. And I'm not gonna talk about that because our next speakers are going to show a case study uh, using the, the building automation system. So looking at uh, some of the minimal tools, this is an, uh, an online uh, tool available in the United States. It's the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And um, it's, it, uh, it's a relatively simple to use. It's easy to enter uh, utility bills. There are uh, multiple methods of, uh, of entering data and covers electric, gas, oil, water, um, covers all of your facilities. You can look at all of the facilities in, in one view like this one. And it allows you to set sustainability goals, you know, uh, so you can, you can set uh, energy use goals um, that it, it reports in a thing called here, I don't know if you can see the energy use index or the EUI in, um, you know, how many, you know, how much energy used per square foot of um, space. And, uh, and you can see on the left hand side here, there's a, um, a roll up of greenhouse gas emissions from all of your uh, from all your facilities. And finally, it can, it can show comparison to other similar facilities. Uh, this is, uh, I'll just show real quickly here, the screen that allows you to enter the data. So you can link uh, an electric meter, um, a utility meter to the site and uh, the site can go out and, and gather your energy and populate um, that portion of the energy, or you can, uh, I'll move to the next slide here. You can, th there are four other ways to enter the data. So you can, um, you can enter them manually. You can put them into a simple spreadsheet. You can download the portfolio manager's spreadsheet and, uh, and enter the data with a more uh, comprehensive spreadsheet. And uh, what's nice about it is that it converts all of the sources of energy to common units. So this is in 
thousand BTUs or KBTUs. Um, and it shows all of the energy sources on one chart. Um, so you can see, um, it allows you to see seasonal variations in your energy. Um, and to, to talk about that, let's, let's look at, this is a, um, a building in, and um, I'm, I want to thank the County of Yates in New York for allowing us to use their, uh, their portfolio manager data. And so this was um, uh, electric and natural gas use from their county office building, an 80,000 square foot uh, building in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Um, so the first thing we noticed is, for, is looking at the natural gas and we see the, um, the uh, seasonal variation as we would expect, higher use in the winter, um, lower consumption in the, in the summer, uh, where we only have to heat um, the domestic hot water, um, whereas in the, in the winter, obviously, we're providing uh, most of the building's heat uh, with the natural gas. Um, the electric uh, consumption, on the other hand, uh, we're a little bit more concerned with when we saw this, in that um, the the winter electric use is about 75% of the summer cooling, uh, cooling load. Um, so typically, well, so as Chris mentioned, um, there's a portion of that is lighting. <clears throat> so there's always gonna be, um, you know, an approximate constant <clears throat> uh, lighting level, <clears throat> excuse me, um, throughout the year. But uh, we would really expect the, um, the summer ventilation, I'm sorry, the, the winter ventilation loads to be lower than what we saw here. Um, and in investigating, uh, we did notice a few things. First of all, we noticed that the, um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, sorry, the air handlers were overheating the air being supplied to the terminal air boxes and that cooling coils in the boxes were, were recooling the, uh, uh, the uh, supply air even in the wintertime. Um, so uh, we also saw that the ventilation remained constant regardless of whether a space was occupied or unoccupied. So some of the recommendations we made were, were to reduce ventilation in unused spaces. Um, and they also were using uh, you know, 50% uh, outside air uh, and they were using MERV 13 uh, air filtration, which we, they really didn't need to use both of those. Um, so with the MERV 13, they were able to reduce their uh, ventilation. Um, so we, we suggested uh, reducing the ventilation in unused spaces to reduce the supply air temperature at the air handler and uh, install enthalpy recovery devices in their air handlers, which were modular and, and easy to install. And then also we found some things like reducing uh, their chiller head pressure in the winter time when they don't need to reject uh, heat at such a high temperature. Um, and then finally, uh, this portfolio manager allows uh, um, allows use of, or allows you to uh, make several different reports. This one is an Energy Star report. So in spite of the fact that um, this, this building was wasting a fair bit of energy by heating and recooling uh, the supply air, uh, you know, it still scored 78 out of 100 uh, points on, on the Energy Star spectrum, which is, uh, which is pretty decent. Uh, and then uh, if we wanna take that a little bit farther, um, we can also do a utility bill analysis, uh, or this could be an alternative to the, uh, the portfolio manager if you choose not to, or if you don't have access to it. Um, so this again is uh, monthly um, energy use. And in this case, uh, the blue line represents the energy consumption, the red line uh, represents the demand. And if anybody's uh, not familiar with demand, demand is uh, in, in 
buildings that use um, you know minimum amount of energy um, there's always a threshold uh, you pay a charge for the amount of power you use and that charge it, it, it looks at the highest um, hour or 15 minutes worth of a power consumption over the course of a month and then you pay a demand based on that um, over the whole month so you know having all your chillers turn on at one time and you know and, and creating a big surge um, just once a month can cost you through the whole month um, and so what does that look like from uh, from a money perspective uh, this chart shows again the blue shows the uh, the energy cost, and as you can see in the um, in the summer when the chillers are running, uh, the energy cost is is highest. But um, but look at the these um, cooler months where we're not doing a lot of uh, of air conditioning. The demand winds up being you know costing almost as much as uh, the the energy use. So the, the demand charge. And then if you look at the demand charge and the uh, other delivery costs, you're paying more for the demand and the delivery than, um, than the actual energy used. So it's good to, to be able to take a look at this and see, you know, it, then you can then look and decide, well, it's time to, um, to find out where my demand charge is coming from or where my dem demand um, energy use is coming from. And once you find that, if you can do some scheduling changes to reduce that demand, you can save money without actually having to use less energy. Um, so I wanna move real quickly. This isn't part of energy modeling, but uh, this is just a really handy calculator I found that was developed by the University of uh, uh, Wisconsin. And there's a link here um, to it. This is a, um, uh, an Excel add-in that you can, um, you know, you can download and open for free. And it just gives you a chance to, um, to model your, your building. So um, using all of these sliders or data entry points, um, you can look at, or you can, you can just put in all of the details and, you know, you can actually even tune it according to your energy bills. But then once you've done that, you can use this as a, uh, to provide what if scenarios. You know, what happens if I improve my wall insulation? Uh, should I replace my leaky windows? And you can, you can change these things and see um, how much uh, energy you'll save and how much your bills will be impacted. So you can actually calculate your payback or, or return on investment from uh, this calculator. So feel, I feel free to, go uh, download that and, uh, and play around with it. It's really handy if you're thinking of making changes. Um, now, if we wanna get into the moderate zone to you know, get a little bit more detailed look at um, the, um, the energy we're using, we're, we're gonna talk about meter profiles or, or interval data. Uh, and again, as I'm, if, if you're paying a delivery charge. There are two ways utility companies uh, track that or, or figure out how much to charge you. One is they use peak hold meters, which basically just registers the peak power consumption in a month. And once a month when the meter reader comes out and, and looks at it or looks at it online, they register it and reset it. Um, that gives the, the utility company um, something to bill you on, but it doesn't tell you when that, uh, that peak demand occurred. So the other part of that is interval meter. So if you have an interval meter, you can request interval data. And what that, what that does is it, gives, it, it looks at average power consumption over every hour or more often now 15 minute interval throughout the whole month. And uh, when you, when you um, receive that, it looks like this table on the left, which is a little complicated and hard to deal with. Uh, for every day, there are, you know, a number of hours or a number of 15 minute intervals across the, the columns. And each of those uh, 
uh, cells holds the power consumed um, at that time. Um, I'm sorry, hold on a second here. I uh, oh, bumped my mouse, sorry. Um, so we uh, reached out to our friends at the Pacific Northwest National Lab who developed this energy charting and metrics tool, otherwise known as ECAM. And, uh, and you can use that to convert the data into uh, this um, stacked data that, uh, that will then be used to plot um, your data so that you can visualize it in different ways. Uh, this is from a small manufacturing facility. And you can see that we plotted the energy use um, by weekday, by Saturday, by Sunday, and by holiday to see um, how they're using their energy. And in fact, where are the peaks that are driving that demand charge? Um, so what we found here was that as uh, the, the main shift comes in uh, and fires up all of the equipment for production, uh, there's a, a really big spike and they pay a, a terrific demand charge from that. So what we were able to do is convince them to um, split up their shifts so people come in um, in staggered intervals and the equipment that they, they start up um, then spreads out over a wider period of time, but a lower peak. So saved the company um, about uh, $14,000 a year um, in demand charges when, when they were able to implement that. Um, another, so another uh, feature is that for the statisticians that are listening, uh, you can see the normal ranges of uh, of energy at a, a typical uh, time of the day. And so you can set alarms that if you're, if you're falling outside of the normal ranges, it can indicate that there's a problem and uh, give you something to go look at. Um, and then, um, so the, for the more detailed analysis, uh, I, we typically use some different pieces of equipment. Uh, uh, now, I want to state that RIT does not endorse any particular brand or type of equipment. Um, these are just some of the wide variety of, um, of measuring tools on the market, and uh, we don't have a particular um, favorite. Um, these are just some that I use. And so we've got some that are good for medium uh, logging of power and, and have their own uh, memory. We've got some that are shorter term um, and meant for just, you know, just looking at something for a half an hour or an hour to, to characterize a piece of equipment. And then others still that are long-term metering, uh, but without, uh, without the uh, memory to log the data. And, but so you would have to, you know, network that with a logging device. Um, and just one, I'll go through a quick example of um, uh, how we did the, um, I got a uh, quick example of uh, one thing that we did here. So this was um, data from a brewery. And what we, um, if you look at the, the top uh, chart here, the blue line represents the actual power. In, in this particular uh, brewery, there was only one place to uh, to meter the uh, energy and that covered an entire brewing line. So we couldn't submeter uh, easily um, the, you know, all the different uh, pieces of equipment. But what we were able to do is, is measure the, um, the energy or the power consumption at any point and the energy uh, used during the day. And also the power factor. Um, and so power, so um, uh, different types of equipment um, like uh, motors and uh, heaters have different power factors. So understanding how those power factors work and using the, the um, brewmaster's recipe, the power and the power factor, we were able to disaggregate the power by device. So you can see on the bottom um, chart, we were able to overlay what was running at all of these times. And then we were able to characterize 
um, the equipment so that we could look at any day's worth of data or their other brewing lines and we would understand you know which pumps were running which heaters were, were uh, heating and uh, and then from that we were able to make uh, recommendations uh, turning off unused equipment um, uh, installing an economizer or a heat exchanger between uh, waste um, wastewater or uh, you know, and incoming water to recover the heat, um, using final, uh, reusing final rinse water in their cleaning cycle for, uh, for pre-rinse of the system. So a number of different uh, uh, energy conservation uh, opportunities came out of that. Um, and then uh, finally, there are some other, uh, other things that you can measure some other, so outdoor air temperature, um, relative humidity or, or other measures of moisture in the air, um, return air temperature, supply air temperature. If you have a building automation system, you'll probably have uh, access to all of this. Um, but, and I'm not gonna go into the details here because our next speakers are going to, uh, to cover that. And uh, so speaking of our next speakers, um, uh, so it, I, we talked about um, energy monitoring at different levels, uh, how energy data can, can point to um, operational and sustainability opportunities. Um, and I'd like to uh, turn it over now to our next speakers uh, for a case study of energy monitoring applied to a cultural institution. Samantha Owens and Stephen Carrick will discuss how uh, energy monitoring was applied at the Glenstone Museum to support their preservation and sustainability goals. So thank you very much and uh, turn it over to Samantha and Stephen. Great, thank you so much, Marty. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Owens and I'm the Assistant Conservator here at Glenstone Museum. I'm joined today by Stephen Garrett, the Museum's Director of Engineering and Maintenance. In this presentation, we'll be sharing with you Glenstone's approach to energy monitoring and how we've made changes to be as energy efficient as possible while balancing the need to responsibly protect the artwork. I'll start with a quick background on the museum. Glenstone is an art museum in Potomac, Maryland. The museum first opened in 2006, but underwent a major expansion, which opened in 2018. This grew the site to nearly 300 acres and 60,000 square feet of exhibition space. To support the community's efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19, Glenstone closed for a second time in November and will reopen as an outdoor only experience on March 4th. Scheduled visits are required and admission is always free. Glenstone houses a collection of post-World War II artworks in a wide variety of media with a mixture of permanent and rotating installations and includes outdoor sculptures throughout the landscape. We have six main buildings on the site. Our arrival hall is where visitors check in. The cafe and patio are our two food service areas. Our environmental center functions as both a center for our grounds team and serves as a teaching facility for visitors. The gallery is our original museum building, which opened in 2006. And finally, the pavilions is our newest building, which opened in 2018 and includes our permanent exhibition space. So with that brief overview, I'll step back for a moment into the why of it all. Part of Glenstone's vision is, we define success in terms of decades, not years. We're committed to preservation and sustainability in everything we do. So sustainability was always a goal from the beginning and as an extremely, and an extremely energy efficient building was part of the design process. In order to set our energy goals, we looked at EUI. EUI stands for energy use intensity and it's a unit of measure that takes into account all types of energy used in a year period while factoring in the size of the building. So it's essentially energy per square foot per year, normalizing for all the different forms of energy. A low EUI signifies good performance 
and a typical art museum has an EUI around 150. So therefore at the start, Glenstone set a goal of 100. The graph on the left shows Glenstone's overall EUI for the last three years. A key takeaway is that it's decreased each year. In 2018, it was calculated to be 63, which is already much less than our initial goal. In 2019, we were at 47, and in 2020, we reached 42. On the right is the EUI for our main museum building only. Again, you can see we dropped the EUI each year, which was done by changing how we were using our equipment. And Steve will be outlining some examples of this shortly. And here we have EUI broken down by building for the last year. I do wanna note that I'm showing our most recent data and obviously 2020 was an irregular year. While we did realize some small energy savings without visitors on site, we still had art that needed a stable climate and we still had some staff on site. So this is still a pretty good representation. So looking at the data in this sort of breakdown, we're able to see greater resolution into each building, which helps us identify where we might wanna direct energy conservation efforts. And this graph puts us into perspective with other museums. This is taken from the IAMFA website, the International Association of Museum Facility Administrators, and museums have submitted their own facilities information for comparison. This is showing EUI for 2020 for several different reporting institutions. Um, I did make them all anonymous, but we're the one on the left noted as Glenn. So I'm pleased to say this shows we're doing quite well in energy usage, certainly among the lowest EUI. While we set our energy goals based on EUI, being a new construction, we did ensure we work towards the highest standards. And in fact, we were able to achieve lead gold status for our pavilions building and cafe and platinum status for our arrival hall. Our goals, however, remain the same, to be as sustainable as possible and as efficient as we can and constantly strive to improve. So with that, now I'll hand it over to our Director of Engineering and Maintenance, Steve Carrick, to go through our methods of monitoring and the changes we've made. Great, thanks, Sam. So now we've talked about our goals and our results, how well are we monitoring our energy consumption and what do we do with that information? We utilize three primary sources of energy, natural gas, electricity, and diesel for our standby generators. We monitor all of their respective utility meters and then use sub meters to gain a more de detailed insight into our energy use profile. This is especially true for electricity where most of our loads are metered right down to the specific appliance. For example, every air handler, fan, humidifier, pump, compressor, they each have their own sub meter. We use this understanding of our energy consumption profile in two ways. Firstly, it helps us ensure that our buildings are operating as efficiently as possible. And secondly, it helps us identify, implement, and measure the success of specific energy conservation measures. We have several strategies that help us maintain an energy efficient campus, but it all starts with our team. Every morning, our HVAC technicians and our controls engineer perform what we call a morning building health check. This is done both through physical checks on all equipment and a virtual check on all systems through our building management system. The two engineers, once the independent checks are complete, meet, compare notes, and implement immediate action plans should they find any deficiencies. We are very fortunate to have both a sophisticated building management system and an on-staff controls engineer who can perform immediate adjustments and fine tuning to our sequence of operation. This ensures that all systems are always operating as we expect them to. This includes fine tuning a lot of our control loops and looking for red flags in operation. For example, are we heating at one end of the room while cooling in the other? In fact, Chris showed an example of that earlier. Our controls engineer has also developed building management graphics that quickly illustrate the performance status of all our plant and helps us identify these conflicts in operation. So now I'll just spend a few minutes discussing some of the HVAC energy conservation measures that we've fully implemented, and I'll also describe a couple that we have in the pipeline. Hopefully you'll see that each of these measures were easy to identify thanks to our building management system and the associated metering systems. To be fully transparent, a lot of some of these uh, energy conservation measures were implemented very soon after we occupied our building. And it was before our metering system was fully up and running, but we did use uh, the metering system to identify the measures and we measured success through the reduction in the building's EUI versus actually uh, heat performance indicators at each of the individual devices. 
So Glenstone, where are we? We're in Potomac, Maryland, which in terms of environmental controls has quite a difficult climate. We have a hot, humid summer and dry, cold winters. Sometimes the winters can be relatively warm, around 40 degrees, but it can drop as low as five degrees. Sometimes we get a lot of snow and other times we don't get much snow. And sometimes those extremes can happen in the same day. Therefore, our system must be designed to accommodate all extremes. From an engineering perspective, there are many things that separate working in an art gallery from working in other similar museum facilities. One of the obvious differences is the very strict environmental parameters that we must adhere to. Here at Glenstone, in our permanent collection space, we keep our temperature between 68 and 72 degrees and our humidity between 48 and 51 degrees dew point. I say dew point because that's how we control our humidity. Dew point is an absolute measurement of the amount of water vapor in the air, unlike either relative humidity or wet bulb temperature, because dew point is not relative to temperature, it's independent. When it comes to our art collection, we know that it's not the actual temperature or humidity that can present a problem, it's actually the rate at which these parameters change that can be the most harm. Of course, there's a maximum and a minimum that we must stay within, but if we stay within these higher and lower limits and keep our rate of change very slow, we can in fact move our humidity and temperature set points to match the season and subsequently save quite a lot of energy. So we've written an algorithm that can determine which mode each of our air handling systems is in and make these seasonal changes very gradually. Our system will not allow a change greater than 1.2 degrees in a 24 hour period, for both dew point and air temperature. Depending on the season, the BMS will slowly increase or decrease the dew point and temperature set points until that maximum or minimum limit is reached. Our aim is to stay in that comfortable place where we're neither heating or cooling or dehumidifying or humidifying. In fact, where we are happily sitting in what I like to call slack water, which is that place between high and low tide. As Sam explained earlier, Glenstone recently underwent a major expansion. When we occupied our new building, one of the first adjustments that we looked at was the amount of air that was programmed to be delivered by our variable air volume boxes into our gallery spaces. Typically, the AVs, variable air, variable air volume, have two volume set points, a maximum and a minimum. The system modulates the amount of air being supplied to a space depending on how far the conditions are away from the set point. Our system, on the other hand, was set up as a self-balancing constant volume system, or in other words, the minimum and maximum set points were the same. Realizing this, we saw an opportunity to save some energy and went through our whole system and established minimum air set points that were about 50% of the maximum air volume. Now our system had room to modulate between minimum and maximum, depending on the load that is present in each of our gallery spaces. It's important to note that even though we did adjust the amount of air going into this room, into each room, we did not adjust the minimum outside air, which in these COVID times is very important. Uh, the outside air is metered by an independent system called a distributed outside air processor. So we've observed these systems now and a majority of our VAV boxes spend most of their time at the minimum air level, which allows our fans to run a lot slower, which can, means they're consuming a lot less energy. Most recently, we've just finished implementing another energy conservation measure, focusing on our humidification system. We increase our humidity in an area, mainly during the winter, uh, using clean steam electric boilers. We have four 40 kilowatt boilers. These units are by far the largest consumer of energy on our entire campus. In the winter, when humidification season is at its peak, these four boilers use more than 50% of the total electricity consumed by our pavilion's building. It was clear to us that if we can introduce additional efficiency into this system, we could save a lot of energy. The system was previously configured as two two boiler systems, each one serving approximately 50% of our air handles. We have decided to cross-connect the two systems, creating one large humidification system served by all four boilers. Additionally, we've implemented utilizing the building management system to control the boilers, whereas before they were controlled using standalone pressure sensors on each of the boilers. We now have a four-stage boiler that supplies 10 pounds of steam throughout the entire building. We are in the measurement and verification stage right now, but with all four stages operating, we often only have a single boiler uh, actually needed to produce the steam, and we are very encouraged by the results. Through careful, slow, and deliberate adjustments, we've also been able to make quite a few control strategy adjustments that have yielded some wonderful results. For example, we observed through on-site testing that we could reduce our cooling tower fans energy consumption by approximately 40% by simply limiting the maximum speed to 75%. 
This reduction speed has had minimal to no effect on performance, but has yielded significant energy savings. We've also been very carefully fine tuning our differential pressure set points throughout the entire campus, mainly on our secondary and chilled uh, heating water systems. This slows the pumps down to the minimum required speed that still delivers design water to our index coils, or in other words, the coils that are the most difficult to get design water to. In some cases, we've been able to slow these pumps down by as much as 20% with no deleterious effect on system performance. In our immediate future, we're looking forward, we have several energy conservation measures slated for 2021. These include interlocking our large hangar style bifold doors on our grounds maintenance building with our heating system. And as you can see on this photo on the left, when these doors open, it's like removing an entire wall from the building and uh, therefore all of the heat escapes from the space. So these doors will be interlocked with our heating system, which will effectively shut the heating down when the doors are open. And inversely, when the doors are closed, we'll start heating again. Also, our oldest building called the gallery is equipped with four 15 year old non-condensing, not particularly efficient built, uh, boilers. These provide heating hot water for our heating system and hot water for our snow melt system. The plan this year is to upgrade and get rid of all four of these boilers and replace them with two condensing boilers which I'm super confident will yield immediate energy saving results. We also use our VMS extensively for not only controlling all of our systems, but, but to monitor the performance of all our systems. And we uh, heard Marty talk about this earlier. We use our VMS to trend all energy and environmental points, as well as any system points that require diagnostic insight. At any one time, we are actively trending the temperature and humidity of every space all of our air handling parameters, which includes pressure, dew point, speed, et cetera, chilled and heating water parameters, and a lot more. Additionally, and probably very obviously, we trend every gas meter, water meter, and electric meter throughout the campus. So I'll wrap up my presentation today by emphasizing that we do not undertake implementing these energy conservation measures lightly. Each initiative is thoroughly workshopped by a collections group, a conservation team, controls engineer, engineering director, HVAC technicians, even our chief operating officer gets involved. Once implemented, we monitor the affected system for an extended time to ensure there are no negative, negative effects. Our alarm and trending system coupled with a talented full-time engineering team allows us to react very quickly to ensure that our collection is never exposed to any risk. So with that, and behalf on, on behalf of Sam and I, I'd like to thank you all for inviting us to enjoy uh, to join you here today. Thank you very much. Okay, and I just wanted to quickly mention that Key Culture out of the Netherlands just released a free downloadable books. Um, there, there's uh, several of them focused on sustainability, including one on energy. So this is just one further resource if you're interested in pursuing the topic further. Shown here is a page from their book demonstrating the different calculators that are available to translate that energy usage into carbon footprint. Um, I know several of them were covered, covered earlier today as well, for those of you who are interested in relating it back to that environmental aspect. And also to say that there may be more funding available to implement any changes than that might immediately occur, including a lot of federal grants and local level programs through energy companies and legislation. So if this is a step that you're interested in taking, um, there, there might be um, financing available in order to achieve those goals. So I want to thank um, the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute and Glenstone Museum, and specifically our guest speakers today for their generosity and their time and expertise. I will say that when you leave the webinar, there will be a brief post webinar survey. Please do consider taking the time to complete it. We really pay, we do pay attention to the feedback and the information gathered helps us to evaluate our approach to this grant and to strengthen our educational resources in the future. So um, really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Okay, at this point, we're going to move into some of the questions that came in. Um, the first one was regarding, I'm going to direct this to Christopher Cameron. And the question is, um, if the toolkit loans are available only to US museums or would be available internationally as well? 
Yeah, the the toolkits are the tools kits were something we created under a previous grant. Um, the grant is actually finishing up currently. Um, so within the next few months, we'll be putting that process together as exactly what the loan, uh, how that lo the loans would go. Um, basically, the only thing we'd be asking for would be to uh, for the receiver to pay the shipping cost uh, uh, to and for, from. But um, we have a number of tools. I believe there's uh, six or seven tools that we have in those kits that we're uh, going to send out there. Um, choose from the three that you'd like for your institution. Again, from infrared cameras, light meters, um, anemometers, temperature guns, a whole number of, uh, of items. We're also looking to expand those tools as well. Um, and then you, you would reach out to us, let us know uh, which tools you're interested in. We'd be opening that up. Again, it's... Um, the grant will be finishing, so it's open to anybody, uh, including international. We're just would be looking for. We want to keep that program rolling. We don't want to just end it when the grant ends. We want to make sure others can benefit from it as well. So, um, keep an eye out for that. We'll send it out in the either the IPI newsletter and make some of that information available on this list as well. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and that's actually the only question that we've received so far. So if you have any further questions, again, the email addresses of all of the speakers today are, are on that um, on this slide that you're seeing now. So please feel free to reach out. Um, oh, we did just get one other question. So I know we're right at uh, just a little past three. So uh, if we can stay on to address this, that would be great. Um, so I think this question would go to Stephen and Samantha. So at Glenstone, did you consider using any type of renewable energy like solar before the most recent museum expansion? I can uh, jump in and grab that. Um, and we certainly did. In fact, we do. And we tried to focus what we discussed today on things that we implemented after we had opened our building. But we're a fairly new building. So our design already incorporated a lot of really innovative uh, energy conservation uh, measures. But one of our buildings, our arrival hall, the Platinum Building, it has a full solar array on the roof. And then actually two of our other largest roofs are made ready to accept solar. But at the time, uh, it, it, it didn't make sense for us to do it at the time, but we knew it will make sense for us to do it very shortly. So we've put all of the uh, pedestals are up there, all the pathway for the electric is up there, and we're ready to jump on that as soon as uh, as soon as it becomes logical to do it, which frankly, the economics of solar right now, it's becoming really logical to do that. And we're having those conversations as we speak. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, I see we did just get another question about um, a similar presentation or case studies pertaining to older buildings. Um, certainly we do a lot of work with historic houses. Um, so I, I think that's certainly a, a possibility for the future. Uh, if there is an interest in that, I would very much encourage you to include that within your survey responses and we can use that to, to make the case for why we should continue to uh, offer uh, energy monitoring focused webinars and, and take on some other case studies as well. Okay, so th thank you all and apologize for going just a little bit past three here. Um, that recording will be available. And again, thank you all for being here and we appreciate your time. All right, thank you.